the 1750s, Britain holds the East Coast, while Canada and the Mississippi Valley are dominated by the French. Between those two empires lies a giant prize called the Ohio Country, a region the size of France that is largely empty and up for grabs. Both France and Britain set their sights on one spot in particular, a strategic river junction called the Forks of the Ohio, where Pittsburgh stands today. But the Forks of the Ohio isn't theirs for the taking. The native people consider this their land and not something that can be traded or sold. But there is one Indian leader in the region who is willing to talk. The Half King. The same man who will play such an important role in George Washington's life two years later. It's Swahe. The name no Jay. The name no Jay. Don't ever forget that any sign of friendship that we make to the English will not escape the French. But the French seem weak. While the English traders give us goods and our hunters bring the skin. In native tradition, women elders provide counsel for important decisions. For the half-king, the stakes in this upcoming negotiation couldn't be higher. Most of the region's Indians prefer the French, but if the British offer him generous trade goods to distribute among these people, an alliance with Britain could put him in a position of power. It's a dangerous gamble, but the half-king has few options. These people are refugees who have been driven out of their homelands in the East by tribal wars and European settlers. Diseases have devastated their numbers. Now 3,000 of them have made the Ohio country their new homeland. They guard it jealously. But with the French encroaching from the north, and the English from the east. The half-king knows he must make some kind of accommodation. Yes, 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 yes. Why are they firing? Nothing to fear. It's their way of welcome. It's when they fire their guns at the end of the power that you need to worry. force of nearly 900 Indians, Canadians, and French regulars moves just as fast toward Braddock's column, still hoping to catch them at the river crossing. It's impossible to say who is more surprised when they encounter each other deep in the woods. Canadians into the woods, 
He'll fight the battle the Indian way. In the beginning, it looks as if the highly disciplined British will prevail. Their volleys prove deadly immediately. Beaujeu is one of the first to fall. But once the Indians and Canadians slip into the hills on either side of the British, everything changes. Washington and the other officers struggle to keep their men in formation. The French regulars are deployed in front of the British column, blocking any forward movement. while the Indians and Canadians snipe at them from both sides. The British start to fall back, but on the narrow forest road, they collide with the troops behind them. Chaos ensues. Deadly tangles of redcoats massed together, making pathetically easy targets. Artillery proves useless in the dense woods. It doesn't take long for the attackers to reach the rear of the British column. It is said that of the 54 women who marched with Braddock's army that day, only four returned. Some of the missing would turn up in Canada ransom from the Indians by the French. After three harrowing hours, it's over. The French and Indians have lost only 21 dead, while nearly a thousand British and provincial soldiers are killed or wounded. Washington has had several horses shot out from under him, but is unhurt. What's left of Braddock's army makes a desperate retreat. The shocking scenes which presented themselves in this night's march are not to be described. The dead, the dying, the wounded, the groans, the lamentation, the cries of the wounded for help along the road were enough to pierce a heart of adamant. But the folly consequence of opposing compact bodies against the manner of the Indians fighting in the woods, which had in a manner been predicted, were now so clearly verified. As they pursued their own aims, the Indians were drawn deeper into the struggle. In 1755, with the help of a small French force, 
they defeated the powerful British army and killed General Edward Braddock. But by 1759, Britain was scoring victories, and the French were struggling to maintain hold on their territory. The fortress at Louisbourg has fallen. The way to Quebec is now wide open. Now, how shall we hold the West? February 1763, Britain and France signed the Treaty of Paris, ending at last the Seven Years' War. King George III now rules more territory across the globe than was ever held by the Roman Empire. But the territory in North America is now so vast, the British must find a new way to manage it. The king issues the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Among its provisions is a new boundary. The proclamation goes even further than the Treaty of Easton, asserting that all lands west of the Appalachians, the heart of the continent, are reserved for the Indians. And yet, more immigrants than ever are settling in the backcountry. In the 1760s, the Ohio country plays host to a new migration from Britain and other parts of Europe. Newcomers cut their way into North America's interior, often marking the corners of their land claims with their initials. The migration was fueled by letters from friends and relatives who had served with British forces during the French and Indian War. Colonials had been fighting for access to the continent's vast interior. After all, that's what they thought the war was all about. And now the king has declared the very land they are settling is off limits, reserved for Indians. And there was another source of tension, money. The war had doubled Britain's national debt. British taxpayers had long shouldered the burden. Now Parliament expected American colonists to pay their share. A small tax on paper, the Stamp Act, causes an unexpectedly violent reaction in the colonies. Riots break out. Tax officials are burned in effigy and forced from their jobs. The tax is widely ignored. Why is the reaction so incendiary? The root of colonial frustrations can be traced to the French and Indian War. As far back as 1755, General Braddock had met resistance when he demanded the colonists pay toward the cost of the war. You cannot tell me you have not the power to make these little assemblies do the king's will. The relationship changed when William Pitt became the king's prime minister and treated the colonists with respect. Letters, gentlemen, from London. They had been happy to contribute to the war effort as long as they were considered full partners in the empire with the same rights as people in Britain. But now, Parliament imposes this new tax without their consent. The colonists feel betrayed. <laughs> 